Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome for the guest lecture two of uh, SLMA Anniversary uh, Medical Congress at Hall B. Uh, the guest lecture two is about environment and communicable diseases. Today, our guest lecture speaker is Professor Bruce Maycock, the Secretary General for the Asia Pacific Academy uh, Consortium of Public Health, the Honorary Professor of College of Medicine and Health Sciences, University of Ex Exeter. The Professor Bruce Maycock uh, is the Secretary General for the APAC and he was the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Curtin uh, University, Australia, and currently serve as the head of the School of Public Health within the Faculty of Health Sciences. The Bruce has authored numerous articles on wide range of diverse topics, including competency development, the training, quality management, health promotions, the health promotion advocacies, the ev uh, evaluations of health promotion programs, the drug use, the policy development, and international health promotion training. So I warmly welcome Professor Bruce Maycock for this guest lecture. Over to you, Professor Bruce Maycock. Thank you. Can I just check that everyone is able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I am delighted to be there, even if it's virtually, and um, my uh, sincere gratitude to the Sri Lankan Medical Association for inviting me, but um, also to my very dear friend and your president, um, Indica, and my condolences to him in this uh, difficult time. When I was asked to present on this particular topic, I decided what I would do was to talk a little bit about the socio-political environment and then relate back to COVID. It may be slightly different from some of the other presentations you've seen. COVID has transformed our world. It's exposed weaknesses in our society which were often dismissed as unimportant. It's shown us societal strengths that have aided countries with their COVID response and diverse issues such as manufacturing, housing, contract allocation, community values, trust, communication, and most of all, importantly, leadership, have been shown to be critical to the prevention and control of COVID. The role of public health has never been more important, and we have been asked to provide leadership and advice beyond our traditional training. Some high-income countries that one might have expected to provide global leadership um, have so far failed in their COVID response. Over the last couple of months, APAC has conducted regional webinars with leaders involved in advising or leading their country's COVID response. And participants from Sri Lanka, China, Vietnam, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, Malaysia, Thailand, Korea, and Australia gave regional insights into the strategies they used and the lessons they've learned that, and the influence of socio-political factors in those strategy selection. We can see in our region that countries have learned from SARS and MERS, and those who have maintained strong public health infrastructure and training have actually often gone on to trial communication and tracking strategies, have maintained production of uh, essential resources, and have leaders who have been willing to make culturally appropriate uh, decisions. So what I would like to do is to present some of these insights, and if we can go to the next slide, please. To present some of these insights, uh, sorry, go back, you've actually gone uh, two slides too far forward. Um, present some of these insights, that's it, stay on that, oh, that's it, okay, thank you. Present some of these insights to consider how do we actually continue in this very politically charged situation? And what are the positives and negatives of the cultural values and the role of respect and equity, trust and leadership in these very turbulent times when we start to see restrictions both easing and then tightening and easing again. We have a multitude of approaches that have been used in our, uh, in our response to COVID. In our region, we have countries that have taken strong lockdown measures, imposed movement control orders, but we also have others that have maintained a business as usual approach and relied upon social distancing and mask wearing and often monitoring by electronic means. The decision to decide what to do depends upon a multitude of factors. And it's also about the political leader's understanding of the relative risks, not just from a health perspective, 
not just from a technical or resource capacity perspective, but also We are sorry about the small connection error. We are trying our best to uh, connect uh, Dr. Professor Bruce uh, in short while. Political leadership is absolutely critical to all aspects, particularly around aspects around communication and resource allocation. I'll just pause for a second and wait for that slide. And the next one. The slide I'm wanting to see is the one with the um, these the political and economic ones removed. That's it. Thank you. So the decision on what actions to take is very political. Click again, please. One more click so the political element comes up. That's it. Oh, no, you've gone backwards. Okay. Keep going, please. Forward. And again. Okay, stay there. So the political element is particularly important. And political element actually decides on the nature of the communication strategies and the type of the leadership. But one of the factors that we also have to consider is issues around political stability. And we can certainly see in countries which, for example, have elections looming, that the opposition uh, behave differently to those areas where there may be more political stability. Next slide, please. And click again. Thank you. So I want to just take an example from Taiwan. So Taiwan um, learnt a lot during the SARS and its response to SARS. And in particular, in 2004, it actually created a National Health Command Centre but also changed the legal frameworks under, for, that supported CDC and associated health areas. They developed pre-existing plans, and the important bit with that was that they also allocated budget and resource to, resources to be purchased. So it wasn't a plan that stood without support. They were able to start the implementation of that back in 2017. Another click, please, advance again. And they actually started screening on board in December 31st. So this was when the first notification from China had come through. They established their epidemic control and command centre in early January. And that was three days before Wuhan even went into lockdown. So this is an amazingly rapid response. They detect their first COVID cases in January. And on January 23, they went into a level three advisory for China and the restriction of flights. Now, Australia also detected their first cases in January, but we weren't as an advanced in our response. Taiwan had masks available to, for purchase for its population in January. There were daily communications by health leaders and regular communication by political leaders. Click again, please. And work continued, schools continued, shopping continued. And they also took steps to control any false information. Click again, please. By April the 1st, and this was not an April Fool's joke, they actually were able to donate 10 million masks to developed nations. And their leaders made a comment that there was no magic to it. It's just isolation and quarantine. 
I think epidemic control is like a race to see who gets the upper hand, the people or the virus. Click again, please. I think it's worth contrasting that then with this headline from the Times, where there was a declaration of a national emergency, but it wasn't until the 24th of March. Click again, please. And the first time the President of the United States supported mask wearing was the 21st of this month. So it's stark contrast to see what's happened in this region compared to, compared to what's happened elsewhere. Click again, please. And again. So one of the big issues for this particular model is the aspect around eco economic or economic vitality of, a, of a, a nation. And again, political leaders are well aware of financial capabilities and resilience, disposable income and household savings and business income. Click again, please. But one of the things that this uh, pandemic has shown us is that we cannot continue to do business in the same way that we were before. And particularly in the awarding of contracts. So services have to be based upon quality. And what we have seen is we've seen examples where contracts were awarded that required technical skills to companies that were not competent. And these contracts were often awarded around the lowest cost tender or for other reasons. They were immensely counterproductive and they were being implicated in the resurgence of the virus in some countries and poor tracing containment in others. Click again, please. And again, thank you. There are many environmental factors that also impact upon the pandemic. Some of them are, are natural, but many are around are human constructed. So for example, there's great variability in our region around healthcare and preventive health resources and the associated capabilities. But it's also about how those resources are applied and how populations engage with the strategies that we select that become very important. And click again, please. One factor that's become important was that that, of, that particular factor of housing. And this is particularly for migrants and refugees and students. Any situation where people are crowded together with limited washing facilities is a concern. The virus has highlighted existing inequalities and the challenge for us is how we respond. Vilification should not be an option. Click again, please. One, because it's dehumanising, but it also increases the stigma and discrimination. And the second is that it actually allows large portions of the population to disengage from the main messaging, as they're able to rationalise that the messages don't relate to them, they relate to the refugees or the migrants or those who are in cramped housing. Click again, please. One of the elements of the PESTEL model is it also asks us to consider technological factors. And we've found, for example, many nations that had over time reduced their own internal capacity to manufacture essential services. We found nations that were running short on hand sanitizer or had outsourced all of their professional uh, protective equipment. And these were important considerations. One of the other elements, oh, no more, don't advance yet, please. Um, one of the other elements of this was that the capacity of populations to use the web or social media or smartphones actually enabled some countries to adopt strategies that were not even possible a decade ago. From a social perspective, the pandemic has also shown us what demographics and pre-existing equity and inequality could actually exacerbate the impact. And one of the things that's become very clear is that there were some values that actually appear to mitigate or contribute to COVID and COVID um, moving through populations. You'll see on this next click that I have enlarged the value of trust because one of the commentary that came from all of the countries that 
talk to us in our region was that trust was absolutely critical to the adoption of and the compliance with the COVID prevention plans. Click again, please. Thank you. And again, thank you. The other element around social implications is that you have to have a good understanding of health literacy and communication. Click again, please. And what I would like to do now is just spend a couple of moments looking at some of those values. In particular, the aspect around altruism, collectivism versus individualism. So altruism and collectivism have seen to be supportive of strategies. When people have been asked to stay at home or to socially distance or to in some way do something which caused them personal disadvantage but was to the benefit of others, they were far more receptive to that message if they had a collectivist or altruistic perspective. Indica indicated to me that one of the reasons Sri Lanka was successful was that people wanted to do the right thing by Sri Lanka. In other countries, it's because they have a very strong collectivist and sense of responsibility to the community. And so while we have seen protests against protective strategies such as mask wearing in countries which are high, have high individualistic values, it actually doesn't mean that those countries won't get compliance. What I actually think it's more reflective of is the lack of leadership, but also the lack of sophisticated messaging. Just hold there for a second. So what, what this means is for when we have poor messaging, people are unable to actually decide how to respond. And a good example of that is the US. Click again, please. Because Fauci told me to do it. People believe in him as a leader. And this sense of his capacity as a leader is actually juxtaposed to their president's positioning. If they were united, the US response probably would have been far stronger. And this gets us to the fundamental issue about trust in government or trust in health leadership. Both of these are needed if we're going to get an ideal response. Click again, please. One of the things that's tested, I think, many nations is how to actually respond. How do we communicate over the life of a pandemic? It's easy to get the first bit of messaging right because the messages were relatively simple. But as the situation emerges, as people change their behaviour, as the prevalence of the pandemic increases and decreases, issues such as how we communicate become particularly important. Broadly, they need to be evidence-based. They need to be responsible. They need to be repeated in many, many different ways. They need to be clear, consistent, honest, and culturally acceptable. For example, the Dean of Mahidon University uh, during one of her presentations to us, talked about the fact that Thailand was not a reading society. Hence, they needed lots of visual, radio, and other non-text-based information materials. One of the challenges for us, though, with the pandemic as it evolves, is there are lots of ambiguities. As we start, for example, to release lockdown, if we've been in lockdown, people in the community ask us, well, why can we ride in public? Sorry about the delay for the connection errors. We'll be trying to connect uh, Professor Bruce in a short while.
a small uh, announcement for the audience if you have any questions you are free to send us uh, through the chat option in the zoom link For a short while, we'll be holding uh, and pausing our session. What was what was the last thing you heard? We have uh, Professor Bruce again. Hello, everyone. What was yeah, the hi. last um, bit of information you heard from me? I wasn't sure when I dropped out. Is it the last one, sir? That's the last one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. I'll, I'll just I'll just reiterate a couple of the important bits. Um, to that, because I'm not sure what everyone heard. Part of our issue for us is that during a pandemic, our communication messages have to adapt as the pandemic changes. In Western Australia, one of our states is experiencing a second wave. But this time, we're not getting the same level of response that we were the first time. And partially that can be explained by the fact that our communication hasn't adapted. So we have to be able to explain to our populations the adaptions to change. And if this is not done, then once again, trust will diminish. Click again, please. So what I've attempted to do is just very briefly orientate the, the audience to a pestle model approach to the socio-political factors that will impact upon COVID and our responsiveness to COVID. If you click again, please. I have focused on just a small number of these issues. And for each country, there will be more and more that they would have to consider. But in the long term, the main elements for us are strong, consistent communication that adapts to the changes over time. Strong and consistent leadership and a continuity and agreement of leadership so that we're not showing division as we're attempting to communicate with a population. I'll pause there and um, just wait and see if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bruce. So if there are any questions, we are free to take up. Uh, Professor Bruce, uh, uh, one question. Additional to these uh, pandemic uh, issues, uh, what are the other uh, communicable diseases and what are the link, links how the environment is directly affecting uh, for the other communicable diseases? Well, if, if I was thinking about just Australia, um, there are many communicable diseases that have direct, um, direct relationships. One of my colleagues was working on a trachoma program and, um, you know, a, a very preventable eye disease. But, and, and, and it's quite prevalent in some indigenous populations. The primary environmental link there is the lack of, of water and sanitation facilities. So something as simple as, as being able to wash and wash your face, wash your hands is, is not necessarily possible. We also see elements around crowding and, and so forth here. So, but, but I deliberately wanted to focus on, on the COVID issue. Um, I could have talked about other, other uh, communicable disease, but I, I think it's important that we recognize that COVID is not just about a health response. It's very much about a population um, being involved. And given we still have perhaps another 12 months before we're seeing, you know, um, we're seeing um, immunisation against it. So a, a response, so a medical response um, to it. We need that population to continue to be um, trusting of the solutions we're providing. Yes, thank you, Professor Bruce. And along with the pandemic issue with the COVID-19, we see a lot of uh, plastics has been used uh, along with the, uh, a lot of people are using uh, the PPs and there's a huge usage of plastics. 
what do you think about the other communicable diseases and this plastic issue the wastage well, of plastics i'm not so so strong on the uh, other communicable diseases but there's an interesting one of my other roles is that i serve on a number of um, international um, panels where i'm looking at the role of oceans and its contribution to human health and disturbingly we found um, so we found ex uh, traces of uh, amr that had colonized plastics found in the ocean and were being transported um, through the ocean um, on these particular plastics. Now, in the Sri Lanka Indian region, the uh, AMR is a particularly, so antibiotic microbial resistance, is a particularly prevalent um, and, and worrisome issue. And so the disposal of plastics into the ocean may be contributing to the transmission or at least the transport of that. Um, it's actually, uh, it's very worrying. Yeah, that is a very valid point, Professor Drews. Uh, that brings uh, for the final or uh, the conclusions of this uh, guest lecture. Uh, I'm very much thankful to Professor Drews Maycock for joining with us from Australia uh, through Zoom for our sessions. And this concludes the guest lecture number two uh, for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Be well.